If your price isn't your life, then you can be bought. If you don't own your integrity above the monetary price on it, then you don't own it at all. And then you can be bought. It's just about finding the price. But for, for some people, integrity trumps everything just because that's how they find purpose and meaning in the world. Personally, I can't think of any worse thing than not respecting myself or not living up to what I demand from myself or from others. Once you legitimize forcefully restricting people's freedom over a narrative of risk, it's game over because that's that's a slide that it never stops midway. It stops at complete prison world. I, I think that that was also a good thing that more people probably have uh, made their observations and reflections on the dynamic between freedom and, and safety. This is the Freedom Footprint Show, a Bitcoin philosophy show with Knut Svanholm and me, Luke DeWolf. And we love to expand our freedom footprint. We hope you do too. The best way to do that is, of course, to emit as much freedom dioxide as possible. The best tool we have for doing that is, of course, Bitcoin. Before we dive into today's show, we'd just like to tell you a little bit about how you can support us. First, to support us directly with Bitcoin, visit our Geyser page at geyser.fund slash project slash freedom. Or you can send us stats directly to freedom at geyser.fund. You can also support us as you listen by listening to the podcast on Fountain. The app is available on Apple and Android and you can stream sats or send a boost. It's the easiest way to support the show just by listening normally. And if you don't care too much about Luke, you can always visit knutsvanholm.com where you can buy my fabulous wine, my books, and a t-shirt or two. And if you don't feel like supporting your fellow Bitcoiners at all, at least like, subscribe, and brush your teeth. But seriously, that stuff actually helps. It would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the videos, send us a comment or leave us a review. All this stuff really helps the show. Seriously, click the damn bell. So thanks for tuning into the show and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Here's an idea for you. Come and see me and Luke in Prague, my favorite European city. With over 100 world-class speakers and the chance to meet more than 100 leading Bitcoin companies, this is where ideas flourish, connections are made, and Bitcoin's path forward is forged together with 10,000 enthusiasts and professionals. In Prague, people have been fighting for freedom since forever. So it's only natural that Prague is the Bitcoin capital of Europe. You should be there. With three days of keynotes, panels, and side events, BTC Prague is the place to be for pure Bitcoin-only signal. And the beer is just fantastic. Use discount code FREEDOM for 10% off your ticket and another 5% discount if you pay with Bitcoin. So remember, use code FREEDOM and see you in Prague. Adlanat, welcome to the Freedom Footprint Show for our special 100th episode. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, guys. Looking forward to chatting. Now, just to be clear, this th this man over here, uh, or this cat over here, is a uh, an entity who claims to be Adlanat, the f infamous Mr. Cat. But uh, as far as I know, there's no like real evidence that he is or isn't. Uh, so, so are you planning on like uh, going to court with that and and figuring out what the actual truth about you being hodl or not really is? <laughs> I don't see any way out of it, to be honest. I mean, the truth must come out. So, yeah, I yeah, it's it's not as simple as just signing a bunch of uh, private keys, or signing a message. Uh, like uh, that would be too easy, right? You need like years in court to finally settle. Yes. This. Very different steps to this process, you know, including like thesis samples and uh, stuff like that. So it's yeah, it'll be a process. Yeah, and uh, th there's so many programs you have to have in order to, you know, uh, retroactively uh, make the correct documents to prove that something happened ten years ago. Exactly. It's uh, it's it's a lot of work. For Proof sure, of work. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I think I think we will end up in a good place. I think so too. <laughs> well, in all, in all serious, dear Mister Cat, um, I I know you're not a a vengeful spirit, but how do you feel now that the uh, uh, that we are actually provably all Satoshi except one person on Earth? <laughs> I mean, that's been my truth and your truth and the, all of my friends' truth for a long time. So I don't really feel much different, you know, nothing changed uh, in regards to facts. But uh, of course, it's uh, it's a huge joy, I would say, to see truth establishing itself outside of us who always knew and to see, you know, the, the tip of the dildo consequences starting to, you know, tease, tease yes. a little bit. <laughs> it seldom arrives lubed, does it? The, that old. <laughs> I think this one is going to be extra unlubed. 
<laughs> yeah, and I heard that uh, that that judge has ordered his uh, uh, his funds frozen, which is like double hilarious, right? Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it sounds crazy. Worldwide freezing order on on his assets. I think I don't think it's often that a UK judge goes to that step. To be honest, I, I have no idea like the how it will be executed and what type of power UK courts have internationally. Well, probably significant, <laughs> but um, it it obviously underlines uh, quite a few things uh, about Craig Wright, as the judge uh, explicitly said in his uh, freezing order judgment. So there will be nothing left to the imagination in regard so who and what Craig Wright is after we get the final written judgment in a couple of weeks, hopefully. But uh, yeah, it's it's hilarious that the guy, you know, instantly after Lou getting this unexpected uh, verbal judgment from the bench saying that Craig is not Satoshi and so on, he immediately started, you know, to try to evade the UK with his uh, remaining funds. Uh, probably some pocket money he got from from Calvin uh, after Calvin got bored of funding all this shit. Do you think you could give us a, 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 for any of our listeners who aren't aware of some of the backstory, a short TLDR on uh, all the backstory of this and uh, how you got unfortunately involved? Yeah, I can do a super short one because I'm sure a lot of people are getting bored with this story, me including. Uh, I do very much look forward to not talking about this shit anymore but uh as long as it's a thing it's a thing and it's not i mean i can only control my own actions and i'm still in two active lawsuits so a very short uh, summary in 2019 i tweeted that uh, craig wright is a fraud and they decided to uh, uh, go after me legally they wanted me to apologize to craig and uh, say that he is satoshi nakamoto or else they would dox me and uh, take me to court. And uh, I never obviously was willing to say that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. So five years later now, uh, yesterday actually marked five year anniversary to the day uh, when I first received these threats. Um, So it's been a really long fight in the justice systems of Norway and United Kingdom. And uh, I've gotten to test my own stamina and uh, I don't know, my own uh, willingness to put my head on the chopping block. Um, and But most importantly, you know, it's been an amazing journey to see and feel all the support from Bitcoiners who helped me stand strong. So I'm definitely, this has been another one of those <clears throat> kind of a blessing in disguise. I mean, it's not totally not a blessing to have five years of your life disrupted like this, but when you approach it stoically, there are blessings to be found on the road and a lot of them. And I really, I feel better and stronger now than I did five years ago. So happy. No, well, that's great to hear. Um, and but this this trial in the UK now where where uh, Craig was proven not to be Satoshi, uh, it uh, that had lit- very little to do with you, right? Yeah, my cases were libel cases, are libel cases. I mean, to say they had nothing to do with me is like a truth with modifications, I guess, because throughout the the trial, my Norwegian trial against Craig was mentioned extensively. It was, I did a search in the skeleton closing arguments from Copa, and my case was referenced more than 70 times in the closing arguments. And, uh, you know, even in this written judgment from the judge yesterday, it was referred to Craig's conduct in my case. So it's, it, my case has definitely helped, you know, Copa established this web of, of lies and deceit and kind of forced Craig and his uh, witnesses to <laughs> to contradict themselves several times. So even though the case, 
my cases are still ongoing after this. I will have to make them go away on my own. But uh, yeah, it, I think I think my efforts helped uh, Copa, and that made me happy. Yeah, and what does Copa stand for? Crypto Open Alliance. <laughs> it was formed, you know, to protect uh, Bitcoin entities from uh, hostile lawfare based on patent trolling and shit, which uh, was one of the strategies that uh, Craig and Enchain were aiming for. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I guess Craig's chances are uh, against you now are are practically zero, right? It would seem so. It's, I mean, he's now declared. Ba basically, reading the ju judge's judgment now is almost like reading my tweets from five years ago. So, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what they can do. And if, if they want to go forward in the courts, I'm going to be there. And I don't know. I think it boils down to how much they want to harass me now. Calvin Air has has he said anything at this point? Like what what's his uh, he's tired of paying him? You said like what 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 indications do we have from from that camp? I mean, this uh, CEO Kristen Auger Hansen, who uh, became a whistleblower last autumn, he has leaked a lot of emails, including one from Calvin to Craig, where Calvin basically said, you know, Craig, you're gonna lose so badly. I'm pissed at you for losing so badly. Uh, I'm tired of wasting my children's inheritance on your wrecked lawsuits. And I'm the only person standing between you and the soup kitchen, he, he wrote. Uh, so he was pissed with Craig's lack of success. Uh, and I found it funny that, you know, the day after Craig was deemed to be not supposed to by the judge, uh, unexpectedly because everyone was expecting a written judgment but the judge basically said the evidence is so overwhelming that i basically i can just give you these facts right now to do this not satoshi uh and the day after uh, calvin announced on twitter that uh he had been planning this this trip for a long time so now he was you know bye bye guys i'm going on this trip i've been planning it for a long time so he disappeared from Twitter the day after that, and now he has some some team tweeting for him. Ah, what a what a clusterfuck the whole thing is. Uh, yeah. So I've seen in the aftermath of this uh, when when um, w when it was finally quote unquote proven that Craig was not Satoshi, which should have been obvious to so many people for such a long time. You've seen people from the BSV camp and from the BCH camp uh, sort of uh, coming out on Twitter now and saying, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I was duped, and uh, it wasn't my fault. Um, please let me back into the proper Bitcoin community. Well, well, what's your reaction to that? I mean, I don't know. I don't hold many grudges, to be honest. There are certain people that I want to see consequences being brought to, not the central players. But, uh, I mean, humans are generally able to get scammed very hard. And uh, they're also able to hold on to scam bags for a long time to not, you know, face the, face the wreckage, basically. So I, I feel sorry for many of these BSV people, and obviously this is a big part of why I tweeted so actively back in 2019 about this subject, because I wanted to warn people, because I, I saw some people selling their BTC and buying into this BSV thing, which is really bad. So of course, a lot of people have lost everything. BSV is down something like 98% against BTC from the tops. So, I don't know, sunk cost fallacy, the pain of realizing that you lost everything. I think that's what's been holding a lot of people in this cult until now. But I'm happy to see, like, the cult is really seems to be imploding from the inside at this point. Yeah, it reminds me of that Mark Twain quote. Uh, it's easier to fool a person than to convince them that they have been fooled. 
which is very much the case here, I think. Yeah, I, that's uh, that's a phenomenon that you see a lot in the in the crypto sphere, so to say. It's all that, right? It's it's the scammers themselves, themselves, and then there are people who are are hard to convince that they have been fooled. Yes. So, uh, like, like, do you have any plans for what's what's for you in the future? Like, uh, are you are you making uh, like plans for what happens after your life is de ruined? My life was never ruined, and that's uh, that's I never gave them that uh, win, you know. Uh, oh yeah. And I think yeah, I mean we've been hanging out throughout this journey, Knut, and you know that my spirits have never been broken. So, no, no, you're my you're my hero, man. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's uh, you're <laughs> such a fucking great example to everyone here uh, in how to tackle things like this. And uh, I didn't mean your life being ruined, but time was stolen from your life for a long time like yeah you have to give him that he managed to steal your time he managed to you know uh dictate which cards i was dealt at a certain point in my life and i've been able i had to just you know deal with those cards and play those cards as best as i could but um i know and i understand your question and i don't really have big ambitions of doing huge things in this in this space to be honest you know i I I love hanging out with my friends and my family and uh, talking about being a part of the community. Of course, I fully intend to continue that, but I can't say I have these grand plans of uh, doing wild things. I'll probably, you know, be sitting here calling out bullshit artists in five years, just like I've been doing. Uh, I do have a job now in the Bitcoin space. Uh, I can shill that briefly i work for the bitcoin advisor helping people with the uh, custody helping people get their coins off exchanges so i will have more time to dedicate to work like that going forward but uh, mostly you know i will just uh, enjoy life yeah we're we just signed up for that uh me and luke too so we're or, or uh Quite a while back now. Uh, I mean, we're also Bitcoin advisors. We're all Bitcoin advisors here. I didn't know that. So we are colleagues. Is that what you're saying? We're colleagues. We are colleagues. Hey, that was fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. It is awesome. And I guess so this is uh, just like colleagues around the water cooler right now. Yes, it is. We're we're around the water cooler here. Yeah, and uh, uh, I mean. People will still be wrong on the internet, right? So you do have that job as well. Yeah. And it has been extremely important. And I 100% think it will continue to be important that people speak their minds in uh, in Bitcoin. The meat, the meat space, the meat layer of Bitcoin is an in integral part of Bitcoin, obviously. And we do need people to be brave and to stand up and say unpopular things and call out popular people, uh, slay heroes, because these social, these meat space narratives, if the wrong shit takes hold, it can still harm Bitcoin, uh, in my opinion. And just, you know, to have hundreds or thousands of cyber hornets continuously picking apart the small lies and the big lies, I think it's important in Bitcoin and it's, it's important in the world outside of Bitcoin. So, uh, yeah, and Bitcoiners are good at it. And uh, I intend to continue speaking my mind, at least as much as I can. 100%. Yeah, that's that's crucial. And uh, yeah, that's one one of the things that I fell in love with with this space. Uh, the, the ability to slay your heroes and speak your mind like that so many people had. By the way, I saw uh, the, Roger Veer showed up in my Twitter feed the other day. Uh, I mean, it's been a while. Uh, do we expect a resurgence of other shitty shitcoin narratives now that, that Craig is gone? I think so. I think, you know, like in the almost like a metaphor for how terrible fashion ideas come back after everyone forgets how bad ideas they were. 
Yeah, this Roger Ware thing, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? Now he's like being whitewashed into some kind of dude that, you know, he's such a crusader for freedom. I see like Bitcoiners retweeting Roger Ware shit now. Uh, like how Roger Ware, Bitcoin was never a get quick, and I get rich quick scheme. It was a get free quick scheme. Go fuck yourself, Roger Ware, you know? I vividly remember his attack on Bitcoin. And it was way more serious than what Craig Wright managed to do. I think Bitcoin was actually under threat for real back in 17. And uh, the methods that he and uh, his side used were sinister as fuck and organized as fuck. And they were, they were funded like, you know, God knows how much money was lost in that attack. But, you know, to, to see people like, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not going to mention any names, but I, I, I just was became aware of this today. And I've seen certain people that I respected and that I would never think was this blind to history or, you know, it, it, it doesn't even make sense to me how they are giving Roger a platform and basically joining this whole small blocker toxic maxis is a problem, you know. We, we need to bring the big blockers back and bring their narratives back. Like, what the fuck? It's, it annoys me. Yeah. And the block size was increased with SegWit. Like, the limit was it increased. Absolutely was. So, yeah. So the attack was, in some way, slightly successful. Yeah. I think the only one I remember fighting for smaller blocks was uh, Luke uh, in it. back in the day. Uh, not me. Oh, no, not that Luke. Another Luke. <laughs> Luke Even though I was junior. told I looked like him multiple times on Madeira, that yeah. was interesting. Yeah, you look do like it? him. Yes, you look <laughs> like him. That's yeah. what you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, look, they look very similar. Yes, you you look minded and uh, and all this. Luke minded. <laughs> You're Luke alike. Well, no, the, That's what the. the, the <laughs> With with uh, with, uh, with Luke though and everything, uh, him being the the only one advocating, as you say, for smaller blocks, now is the uh, basically Luke and, and Ocean Mining are now sort of at this forefront of of uh, the the this fight against, uh, as Knut likes to put it, Schrodinger's JPEGs. Uh, you you have any thoughts on uh, this particular issue? I absolutely do. I'm. I refrain from taking when it comes to, you know, the, the filtering, uh, question, uh, or as it's framed, you know, the censorship question from, from the other side, it's, it, it's felt to me a little bit like almost like it was bait, you know, that they wanted to bait people into starting to filter out this shit instead of letting it die organically since it was, was, and is extremely inorganic. The moment, if you know, a huge part of the Bitcoin ecosystem started filtering this bullshit, it, it would be an amazing way to divide because they would have, if not a fully, fully fleshed out, uh, argument, they would have an argument that would land with a lot of people. This is censorship. This is anti Bitcoin, you know, uh, look at these people. It would be a very powerful way to split the community further. And so, so I kind of prefer to take the stance that this, this is bad faith. This is, in my opinion, probably funded, you know, this mass printing of JPEGs. Uh, but, uh, I think it's not a good idea to mount, to try to, you know, uh, counter it too forcefully. I think it will go away on its own. And there's also, you know, the, the truth that the future will bring very high on chain fees. That's, that's not the question. So we have to start digesting that reality too. And, uh, even if it, it doesn't mean it's okay to prematurely introduce it, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I appreciate that that ocean mining 
was the spun up and that they do what they do. But I also appreciate that they have remained kind of like a niche part of the whole uh, ecosystem. I, I almost totally agree to this. I, I, I also think that the whole debate is very manufactured and very, it's, it's a whole, the, the whole narrative that there is a, a war at all and that there is a, two different sides to a problem that is obviously creating, as you say, this this rift between confused people and less confused people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's for that's those how you that's drink water. Yeah, that's how it gets nice. So, so yeah, uh, I agree. I, I think the filters themselves, though, are are um, are probably a good thing. Uh, every time we find a block that doesn't have this bullshit, it's it's a win for Bitcoin. Yeah, and I mean the filters are filters are applied bottom up, right, in a decentralized manner. It's uh, it's it it is, and it should always be the the choice of the pool which filters they run, and then it's the choice of hash rate which pool they want to mine with. So it's it's not really an issue, uh, but it it could be very easily be be spun into a big issue. Yeah. The, the stance we're firmly taking here, like we, we talk, me and Luke talk a lot about this, and the, like the the stance we're really aligned on here is that we want to m- differentiate between a miner and a hash salesman, because you have to choose which which you are. You can't really call yourself a Bitcoin miner if you don't decide on what block to mine on, like that. Then you're not a miner. You're just selling your computer power to someone else. I agree. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, have you discussed at which point this, uh, like, at which point you move from being a hash rate salesman to, to a miner? Like, because, uh, I mean, uh, there are two polar opposites here, of course. Like, you know, we could actually be like just mining without being in a pool. Then you're a miner, but I mean, you will have zero chance of mining a block. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, you're just blindly mining with some fucked up pool that has maybe a bad policy than your hash rate salesman. But where, like, at what do we need to be able to call a person a miner? Uh, transparency, like from the pool, like, like, um, if if the hash salesman is totally aware of what the the pool is doing, then they can claim to be a miner. But 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 like. If they can't, if they don't know what's coming in the block until the block is actually mined, then they're not miners. They're a hash salesman. Like, and it, but as you say, it's a tricky distinction uh, because you can agree to parts of what the pool is doing, but not all of it. And and the 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 pools can be very deceitful. Like they, uh, as, and this is what's going on, right? They're getting paid off band. They're getting paid off chain. And the the miner never sees that those transactions because they're they're simply not to be seen. So, uh, and this is the problem with the incentives. And and if Bitcoin was only money and didn't try to be anything else, which which should be the case. Like this is the the power of Bitcoin and why shitcoins are are failing. Like it's a huge part of it that Bitcoin does not try to be anything, but you know number that you keep in your head and give to someone else at some point and 21 million all that resistance to replicability uh as soon as you introduce like other use cases that will dilute the value of bitcoin as value free money uh, or wertfrei money uh so so uh, so there is like uh, I mean, I definitely categorize uh, monkey JPEGs and BRC20 tokens and whatnot as spam. There's no debate about that. They are spam. There's no such thing as a rare set, there's, just as there is no such thing as a rare centimeter. Like, uh, it's, it's just a way of measuring uh, something. It's, uh, they, aren't, they aren't there, even. The difference from the conventional use of the word spam is that there, there is little or no skin in the game with email spam, for example. But with uh, this type of spam, it, it costs their shirts, you know, to, to do the spamming, which, uh, which, it, but I agree, it's still spam, but it's uh, unsustainable spam. 
Well, not if you have a money printer. Then it's just as free as email spam. I was caveating that uh, exact thing in my mind while I said it, and it's true, but uh, until we have, you know, uh, more at, at this point, you know, I, I don't think the distance to the money printer uh, is short enough that that's actually what's going on, uh, even though it is. It's a potential attack vector in the future, at least. And, uh, but, but. But there's a very easy cure to it. Just don't sell your Bitcoin. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> Especially not to a politician or, or someone uh, with, uh, you know, access to the monetary spigot. Yeah, and uh, any, any widespread attempt at something like that will just, you know, put a fire under the ass of hyper-Bitcoinization and the hyperinflation of the fiat money. So it's not going to be a sustainable strategy. No, all attacks are welcome. Uh, in the long run. We're thrilled to introduce our new sponsor, the Bitbox 02 Bitcoin Only Edition. Bitbox, 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 Bitbox. It's fully open source, Swiss engineered, and Bitcoin only forever. The device only supports Bitcoin, which means less code, less attack surface, and improved security for your Bitcoin. Check out the Bitbox 02 Bitcoin Only Edition at bitbox.swiss slash freedom. And use code... <laughs> and use code freedom for... Fa- and use code FREEDOM for 5% off. Next up, Wasabi Wallet, the desktop wallet with CoinJoin built in so you can preserve your privacy. Ooh! It's easy to use and open source, and their recent Juggernaut update included loads of upgrades and new features. Ooh! They even added support for Bitbox. Go to wasabiwallet.io and download Wasabi today. Ooh! Speaking of uh, what maybe some others might see as a, as a different kind of a, a attack or at least a different way of kind of money getting into the system the institutional adoption from etfs attack is maybe a strong word but certainly i have uh, heard the angle with with that that that's a way of of the the large institutions of capturing uh, bitcoin basically uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on that and uh, maybe the the outlook uh, for the next little while since the etfs have entered the market yeah it- all of these coins are currently residing in the ETFs, and I'm I'm very sure there will be more coins in the ETFs a year from now than than we have right now. I mean, it, it's a matter of when, not if, that those coins are going to get uh, confiscated by by the state, basically, and uh, just you know. People will obviously be reimbursed with the full value in the shitty fiat currency, but uh, uh, it's a honeypot just waiting to be to be grabbed. And uh, I think everyone's pretty realistic about that. But at the same time, this is also inevitable and an inevitable part of Bitcoin's uh, or the road towards hyper Bitcoinization. And I'm not worried about it at all. It's going to be more lessons for a new generation of people, uh, for sure. And uh, I mean, one perspective that I think is very, at at least for me, having been in Bitcoin for a long time, it's, I'm kind of amazed it it took this long. I mean, they could have swooped in much earlier and done a much worse uh, land grab of coins and and centralized Bitcoin that in that way. Uh, so I'm 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 kind of happy that we managed to get all the way to 24 until this happened. In our, I mean, GBTC has been soaking up a lot of coins, obviously, for a for a good while. But I don't know. I I don't see it as it's it's gonna be like a tool in the future of this war, but it's not gonna make any difference. Well, and the uh, GBTC has sort of been uh, it turned out to be a tool or at least a lever that has been dampening the number go up of it all uh the the skeptic or the the conspiracist uh, among us might think that gbtc was intentionally used to uh, uh give the etfs a, a cheaper access point but they're going to run out of uh of coins themselves uh eventually here and uh then there shouldn't be another lever to pull. But um, what do you think? Do you in, in, indulge in the 
conspiracy that GBTC is sort of in on this to depress the price? I mean, I don't shy away from conspiracy theories, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, it's it's a possibility that this was a play all along. It's it's uh, the setup was almost like a little bit too good to be true that they are dumping this hard for this long, allowing these other BTCs and and you know the BTC pizza slice in general to increase. And uh, I'm noticing how this ETF inflows, ETF outflows have completely dominated the whole fundamental debate of Bitcoin price lately, which is kind of ridiculous, as if there is no demand outside of these ETFs. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's it's good news for all the stay humble tech sets people. And uh, yeah. it's very bad news for uh, people without conviction and uh, emotional traders. I think uh, this, this <laughs> these wicks we've seen lately, I can... The amount of uh, degen tears out there must be overflowing. People who try to speculate the sh short term on getting more sets, it's never a good idea. And for those of you who don't know, uh, ETF stands for Danish Dyslexics uh, uh, Association. So does GDBTC and NGU stands for number go dyslectic, of course. <laughs> That's true. Knut, did you have anything more helpful to add? Uh, no, absolutely not. Your turn, Luke. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, well, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, like, uh, but, but uh, maybe for a lens of the, the kind of, um, not even the, the optimism necessarily, but uh, uh, the other side of it, though, is, is that uh, Bitcoiners who have, have understood what's going on here are the ones actually seeing their conviction uh, play out properly and of course there are these uh, the the ultra bulls in the space uh, samson comes to mind specifically uh, you know million million dollar bitcoin this cycle something like that maybe the cycles don't even exist anymore uh, but but with without talking about sort of an analysis of what the price is going to be the, the basic thesis is that there is a certain amount of bitcoin in the world and there is a growing demand for it, and there is a decreasing supply. Most likely, we're something like five days away from that when this episode gets released. And uh, yeah, so so, what what is your take on on the the next year or two? What do you think we're in for based on the way things are going? I have. Uh... Some thoughts on that. Uh, you know, I, I've been one of the worst permables, I think. Uh, I never managed quite to entertain the idea that Bitcoin could possibly ever be worth less in the future than it is right now. That's always been like, uh, because I always thought Bitcoin was so undervalued. And uh, for years and years, this feeling has just intensified. I think uh, at this point right now, once again, you know, like I would say a year ago or two years ago, Bitcoin has never been more undervalued than right now. And uh, I think there is a chance that Samsung can be right. But then again, trying to predict what Bitcoin is going to do is one of the most futile uh, things you can try to do ever. Uh, there will always be some shenanigans and unexpected shit happening. But I, I do really, really, you know, expect Bitcoin to, to fly uh, the next years. Uh, I can't really see any way that not, that's not happening. But I, I don't like to, you know, I do my predictions on the limb sometimes. Uh, but honestly, you know, I, I have no fucking idea where we're going to go. I think we're going to go high. Would you be willing to go out on a limb here and say, because we're now above 70 for like the seventh time, would you be <laughs> willing to go out on a limb here on the show and say that we yeah, will I never? Mean, <laughs> I, I'm seeing right now we are at 70,150 on Coinbase Pro. Uh, and that does make me want to go out on a limb and make a prediction. So I don't think we'll ever see Bitcoin below 70,000 again. 
no, neither do we. Uh, no, this is the. <laughs> oh, those limbs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they it's fun brain. to be a limb outer goer. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, 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 like, if we zoom out here, what do you think of the stock to FOMO thing that, that this, uh, this whole diminishing returns thing is wrong and that we'll eventually we'll have a J-shaped uh, uh, purchasing power curve instead. Uh, that would be when, when like the last bull run happens. Uh, is this something I'm not like stuck to FOMO? Is, is this a meme I, I'm not uh, familiar with? And the, Maybe the not. I think, it's, I think it's Wicked uh, who, who, who made it the, the first... Or, or who first visualized it at least? Where, where there's like, you, you've seen the classic, uh, yeah, the the one with that Eric Wall turned into this, to this uh, bullshit rainbow chart. Well, that was a joke. I have to give him that, but uh, some people fell for it. Uh, but there's the other th uh, theory is that that rainbow will flip at some point, and you'll get a a sort of your thesis there that <laughs> Bitcoin's cannot go down in price at some point that there's a point where there makes absolutely no sense for enough people to sell so that the price is virtually not going down uh, <laughs> at all like the the last bull run like uh, the, the, it's sort of the way I visualize it actually that on our way to hyper bitcoinization there is a point where, where things get really weird and that is probably that point Anyway, yeah, brain fart. Then, at that point, the uh, the purchasing power of Bitcoin will just be completely uh, correlated with uh, the amount of people in the world, or something like that, uh, or rather, the amount of stuff. I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, the way I see it, like hyper Bitcoinization is not when all the people have some Bitcoin. It's when all the money, uh, when Bitcoin has all the money, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, maybe you can, uh, maybe there, this is like a, a point to get more into here, right? Like, like, what does this actually look like in the future? The the point that uh, Knut is trying to articulate, right? Like that that Bitcoin adoption isn't necessarily for everyone, right? It's it's not necessarily going to be possible that everyone touches the the base layer can you, did you want to jump in and clarify your thoughts here yeah yeah it's it's not that, that that's another thing uh thanks for clearing it up look like it's it's not uh bitcoin is for everyone is is sort of a weird meme it's it's not for every every person it's for every dollar like it's it's not for all the people it's for all the money what do you think of that i think uh i mean i I talked about the amount of humans. I think is is the amount of things really relevant if there are not enough humans to put attention on them and to consume them and have any type of relationship with them? I don't know, but uh, I like your thoughts on this, Knut. And uh, but I I don't think you know I don't I don't spend too much time thinking about, because I think there are so many parameters in play here and so many, it's, it's really fascinating philosophically to, to try to, to visualize this future. But, uh, uh, I think there will be, uh, context and, uh, things in this equation that we quite don't quite see yet. And, uh, it's, I think it's very hard to, to get a grip on how this, uh, future will look like. Uh, yeah. But it's not hard for me to see how instrumental Bitcoin is right now on the road to a more sound future. Can you expand on that a little bit? What are, what are, what are you thinking of that? Basically, just that uh, at the moment, our whole world is, is built on sand and, and built on theft and scam. And uh, it's very clear that... Uh, when you have such a system that uh, enables the bad guys, if we're going to simplify it down to that, uh, to print people, uh, to print money, uh, to incentivize uh, bad behavior that them, them themselves stand to, to gain from, uh, we can never have any sound structures built on such a foundation. And uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, uh, the new world starts with Bitcoin, I think, and uh, the return to, to rationality and the return to merit. We're now partnered with the Bitcoin Advisor, your best choice for collaborative multi-sig custody. The Bitcoin Advisor guides you every step of the way, from taking self-custody of your Bitcoin to securing it in their multi-sig vaults. Estate planning and inheritance is built in so your loved ones can have peace of mind. And you know what the best part is? Me and Luke are Bitcoin advisors, so you can contact us. We can advise you about Bitcoin and Bitcoin custody, how to make custard, anything really. We're Bitcoin advisors. So visit us at thebitcoinadvisor.com slash freedom or send us a DM or email to get started. Contact us within two weeks and we'll throw in a free set of steak knives. Maybe. The show is also sponsored by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin only social network where you can stack friends who stack sats. Make local connections and find all the nearby meetups, see what's going on in your area, and connect with Bitcoiners around you. And now, with a brand new merchant section, it's easier than ever to find and connect with local businesses that accept Bitcoin. The best part about Orange Pill App is that you know that it's high signal, because you're paying for Orange Pill App, and so is everyone else. There are no Asian ladies asking you how your trade is going on Orange Pill App, because it's not a trading app. It's a dating app. Is it a dating app? So download the Orange Pill app on Apple or Android, send us a DM, and start building your local network of Bitcoiners. That this is that's touching on a point that Sailor made to us in Madeira about uh, you know, all the fiat money being toxic. It's a, akin to uh, toxic water, right? So so which means that all of our history books are are colored by this toxicity. Like uh toxic, by the toxic crayons. Our history is painted with toxic crayons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. History is painted with toxic crayons. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so we might have to revise everything and and like uh, try to. And and I know, of of course, a lot of Bitcoiners are doing this already and uh, like studying history and and trying to f read between the lines and figure out what actually happened, like the French Revolution, for instance. Was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? Uh, you know, uh, th there are so many points in history to to revise uh, from this lens. Very much so, and uh, and probably it's. I mean, the task if we're going to talk about trying to set history straight, I think that's almost that's probably a task that's too big to ever really happen. I I had some. I mean, just our recent history the the lies that we have built our current narratives from, they're so big and they're so dark. I mean, just my uh, journey into realizing how fucked up certain things are uh, started with 9-11, I would say. And the fact that 9-11 still stands, like the official narrative still stands and all the the history blocks after that are built uh, on top of that block. And then you have like new, new deceitful blocks being built on top of deceit and just the, the job to unwind, unwind this all, you know, with our recent COVID live block and, you know, the ESG uh, climate blocks and uh, they have gotten such a foothold in our shared consciousness and so many people are so deeply invested in them that to, the the journey to unwind all of this is uh, mind-blowingly big I mean I've I've seen how hard it is to unwind just the lies of one man uh, for five years which was so obviously lies and as long as you put money behind the lies and repeat them loudly enough and many times enough, it's exceedingly difficult to, to unwind it. And, uh, but I think, so I think, you know, that, that can't be the, the focus, the focus must be to just be here and now and do sound and true shit with the tools we have and just trust that the momentum we create will be what unwinds all of this on a long enough time scale. Absolutely. I mean, even the smallest lies uh, that people get away with can have massive like butterfly effects on what people think about things. For instance, when when you watch public service uh, television, uh, 
uh, quote unquote public service television, and they they uh, say that something tax funded is free. Like ju- just framing it like that, when in reality it's actually more expensive because it's not <laughs> on the free market, and thus th- there's no market competition around it. So whenever they say something is free, that is actually more expensive. L- that's little white lie, and. I I think ninety nine percent of the journalists have no clue that that's what they're doing. They have no clue they're lying, uh, because they never thought about these things. Exactly, and and by by lying like that, you you strengthen the power of the core lie also by creating these all of these lies that rest on the on some false premise. Uh, so it's a it's a structure that's continuously reinforced by the whole force of uh, mainstream media and uh, and governments. But then again, I'm very happy to see that the full force of mainstream media is becoming a weaker and weaker force. And, uh, you know, uh, citizen reporting or decentralized individual reporting is, is gaining stronger and stronger foothold in, in how many people consume news and information yeah that's wonderful and like w- that's one of the great things i think uh, uh elon has done to twitter is add that uh, community thing instead of having fact checkers you have community checking of course then twitter is centralized and <laughs> it is you have to trust that twitter is actually doing what they're saying they're doing but at least it's a step in the right direction for sure exactly and at the risk of being branded an Elon simp again, I mean, I do think that Elon taking over Twitter was of just monumental significance and importance uh, because they had a chokehold on on information uh, before that happened. And you can also see, you know, as Twitter or X have opened up uh, and introduced uh, community notes and stuff like that. It's be- basically become a more accountable and open platform in terms of information. People are flocking to it because people, <laughs> without even knowing it, I think people desire truth. And, uh, you, you know, Nostra, as good as it is, I'm a huge Nostra fan, but uh, it, it has literally zero impact on the global discourse of things and uh, because there, is, there are not enough people on there and uh, there, there are no, there's no mainstream attention on it. But the fact that we now have X with all its, its flaws and all its warts and can, small cancer tumors that it undoubtedly still has, it's still good enough, you know, to, to get information out there and to bridge the gap between now and the future where we have a significant and uh, impactful uh, adoption of Nostra and similar networks. Yeah, I uh, I am I agree to 100%. I mean, I love Nostr and uh but I I'm unconvinced about the scaling of Nostr. Like I think there are issues on the way there and I, I'm not entirely convinced that it will uh be successful in the long run. We'll just have to wait and see I I guess but I love that it exists as an alternative because it puts pressure on the other things. Uh, it really does because the, as all exits do, uh, putting pressure on on the competition is always a good thing. Uh, yeah, and I think like Elon taking over Twitter and Jack focusing on Noster is is the it's the timeline I want to live in. And yeah, we'll we'll be uh, we'll also be going to uh, Nostriga in uh, in uh, August uh, in the the middle of uh, an exciting Bitcoin week in Riga. So uh, hopefully we'll get to hear more about about Noster and uh, that uh, uh, Knut might eventually. We we actually have, have been deficient in this. We haven't gotten anyone who actually knows anything about Noster on the show. We've just talked to people who think they know things about Noster. So. We should really get on that and get some people who know things about Nostra, right, Knut? Absolutely. I like that. Uh, I, I was. I hope there will be Nostra sometime in the future Nostra-way. as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nostvanger. No. Nostvanger. <laughs> Riga is looking fantastic this year. Uh, I mean, 
all the conferences are looking fantastic this re- uh, year. But especially, like, I love this little tree of, of Prague, Madeira, and Riga being the high signal, low noise uh, European conferences and, and like, uh, stars aligning there. And Riga will uh, do a little, well, I shouldn't announce too much here, maybe too early, but nah, something. Nah, nah, let's, 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 let's go. Let's go ahead. I think we're, we're, we're good now. Uh, just a teaser. Yeah, just a teaser. All right, where were are we then? Yeah, simply well, no, no, for no, okay. Elon. We're, we're shilling. Let's actually properly shill, Knut. So, for, so for first of all, we're going to be going to Prague here in uh, in a couple of months, and uh, yeah, use code Freedom if you would like a discount, a ten percent discount, and you get a further five percent if you pay with Bitcoin. So, come join us all in Prague, and uh, you know, are you, are you coming, Mister Cat? Probably not to Prague, unfortunately. No, uh, I will. I will make an effort to go to Riga. I have to say, I, I've been talking to the organizers of Prague, uh, Martin and Matthias, uh, quite a bit, and uh, huge respect for them and what they have done. And I'm extremely bullish on BTC Prague this year. You know the the ethos they are gonna or, or like the what they're gonna focus on this year is super important, and uh, I, I I wish I could be there. Well, uh, maybe let's say that you might see Mister Cat there. But probably not. <laughs> probably not. So use code freedom and brush your teeth. Uh, FFS. Uh, that's that's the message, right? <laughs> that's the that's the message. And then and then uh, just since we're on the topic, uh, yeah, in in Riga, we'll we'll be there putting on an Infinity Day party on Bitcoin Infinity Day eight twenty one uh, immediately after Noob Day. So come to Riga early and uh, party with the original meme creator himself, Knut van Holm. <laughs> And then there's Nostriga uh, happening. Just it, it uh, that's the the start of Nostriga, right? Yeah, it starts the next day. Two days of Nostriga, and then and then actual Baltic honey badger. So yeah, exciting, it's exciting be amazing. next year. I hope you, yeah. uh, I hope you make it to that whole thing, uh, Mister Sir. Yeah, Co- code freedom there too. I think, uh, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. How many? How much time do you guys think we have? How many years of this? Coolsy uh, conference thing that we enjoy these days. Like when, when is this thing too big for that to happen the way it's happening right now? I I think about that a lot uh, because I think like uh, if there if something was to happen uh, on one of these things, you you remember this anarcho pulco thing? There was a a murder happening in the same town as as uh, th- there was some some anarchist conference or something. I don't know very much about it, but I know there was some. Uh, th- th- there was uh, so- someone was shot the same week. I don't know if it was connected to that or not, but uh, I mean that sort of ended that whole thing. And I think if if anything happens to any one of us m- public faces in this uh, during one of these events, I, that's probably the end of us being able to hang with other plebs uh, and. Like I, I don't really like the idea of a Bitcoin conference where where you you distinguish between tiers of people. That's that's not really. Uh, I I I I don't like the idea of that at all. Uh, I, so so and that's also why I'm why I'm doing this a lot right now is because I I I want to squeeze as much out out of this as while while the, while it still exists. I mean, you don't know about tomorrow. Like, when when the COVID two point is is invented, then uh, might be very hard to travel. So why not? It's crazy though when you bring that up uh, the COVID thing. First of all, how how quickly we kind of like forgot about it, or or people in general. I didn't forget about Some it. Some did, but, <laughs> but how, I I I totally still have this appreciation for being able to go you know i was in madeira and just to go there with no bullshit you know just order the tickets board the plane go there no dystopian bullshit happening well some not. there's the security some, some, check there's the passport yeah and like that you have to throw away your shampoo because it had too much shampoo in it or something uh to secure the check yeah but, as long as i have my 12 words i don't care <laughs> yeah with what i'm it's we can't take anything for granted, is what I'm saying, and uh, we should, you know, be 
enjoy it just like you said, but we should appreciate and enjoy this shit while it's here and available for us. Exactly. I, I'm just insanely grateful and I bring this up all the time. Like whenever I'm on a plane, I'm still amazed that I'm flying. Like it's it is fantastic. And you don't know how long that will last, even. Like people take so much for granted. Like the 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 phone in my pocket, it's amazing. Like James Bond couldn't dream of this like 30 years ago. Like it's it's just I, I, I do, I'm just so insanely grateful for the things the, the free market has, the, the somewhat free market has managed to produce. And I, I, I think the power of markets in general is so underrated. I'm not a cynic. I'm an optimist because I think the mar- markets are way more power, powerful than, than the Sith Lords. Like the, the resistance will win, especially when we have Bitcoin as the photon torpedoes headed for the core of the Death Star through the vents. You know, that's. No, I'm totally optimistic in the long run. Yeah, me too, uh, for sure. And it's uh, it's very easy to forget uh, all the good shit in a world where the darkness uh, rears its head so much as it does. But, you know, in, in lived and perceived freedom, we probably never ever were freer than right now to, to do shit. But the... <laughs> It's just this ever-present knowledge that you are being tracked and data is being collected. And yeah, you know, we're just like being watched is more the the feeling, I guess, that's changed. But we're still able to to exercise a lot of freedom, uh, not least in terms of freedom of speech. And uh, I think a big task for everyone in the world right now is to not self-censor, not over-comply, so to say. Because a lot of people are, they're just feeling the tendencies in the world and they just get very like apprehensive and maybe don't speak fully out on certain topics. And uh, this, uh, the, yeah, the, the self-censorship and the, the chilling of free speech is a real thing. And we should, everyone should, you know, really try to speak as freely as they dare to on all these subjects that rule the world right now. Yeah, yeah, but fear fear is a, a <laughs> is a powerful tool. I mean, there there are certain religions in the world that people, uh, including myself, don't talk about because why would I want a a threat? <laughs> like if I if I spoke my mind on certain things, like and. Uh, by religions, I include statism, by the way. So, so we are being. Uh, we, I mean, of course, that there, these are powerful forces. But I totally agree. You like uh, and f- exercising your freedom of speech uh, is extra, ultra, super duper important now that speech is property, like which is it never has been before. Like the, the when we have Bitcoin and, and speech is actually. Uh, as close as it can get to tangible property, then then uh, it becomes more more important than ever to to uh, uphold those laws and to fight the battle because the the fight for freedom never ends. Uh, people will always try to uh, try to uh, intrude on your uh, your freedoms. That that's just inevitable. Uh, the way I see it, uh, it's like that Terry Pratchett's quote: "the The problem with an open mind is that people will come along and try to put stuff in it." And so, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to stay vigilant and 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 uh, actually uh, and principled. I, I think it's it's so uncommon that people are principled and and uphold. They 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 don't like oh principles is something you can have uh, if you're that kind of person. Like no, it's for everyone. Like <laughs> a society, a civilized society, needs principled people who are willing to. To sacrifice short-term stuff for integrity, and uh, yeah, so we need heroes like you, Mister Cat. <laughs> I saw uh, I saw a thing going on Twitter a couple of days ago. I don't remember, or maybe even didn't notice where it started. But this, uh, like, the concept was that if your if your price isn't your life, then you can be bought, and that's about you know, if you don't <laughs> own your integrity above 
the monetary price on it, then you don't own it at all. And then you can be bought. It's just about finding the price. But for, for some people, integrity trumps everything. And uh, just because that's how they find purpose and meaning in the world, and that's how they uh, view themselves. And like, <laughs> personally, I can't think of any worse thing than not respecting myself or not like living up to what I demand from myself or from others. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's an int very interesting topic, this whole thing of, uh, it, it is. And it, it's like, uh, th th to me, yeah, that's even worse than the unlubed version of the dildo consequence, right? Regardless of the size, uh, <laughs> that, 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 and it's very close to this notion that if you don't have the right to be left alone, if that's not something that you experience, then the only right you have left is the right to obey. There is no silver lining. Like, either you're free or you're not. And you, you can apply a lot of rhetoric and mental gymnastics to this topic, and people will make all kinds of excuses for themselves for compromising. Mm -hmm. But my experience and my philosophy on it is that once you start compromising, you might, it's just like step one on the full slide to corruption. But you, you just can't compromise on your integrity at all. That's like a binary thing. And I, I wanted to mention another thing that Rune Östgård, author of Fraudcoin, a good friend of mine, he has uh, been reflecting a lot of, you know, the, you know, the fight for freedom and the, uh, and standing up for freedom. And he made the observation that the, the cost of freedom is reduced uh, relative to how many people stand up. And uh, the more people who dare or manage to, to stand up and, and stand for something, that reduces the cost for each individual of doing so. But if you're alone, in standing up, the cost will be severe, and uh, history, in history, it will very often be death. But uh, yeah, so so like the decentralized. I love that framing. Yeah, the like I think it it fits very well to Bitcoin with our decentralized approach and the, all the nodes that uh, the it's almost impossible to quell a movement with a lot of heads that stand up and and fight, so to say. Yeah, and, and also, um, yeah, w w Rune's thesis, I mean, we love Rune here. Uh, uh, he's another hero. The, the, the thing I'd like to add to that is Metcalf's law. So the value of any communications network is the square of its number of users. So, which means that the, the, the value of the resistance <laughs> is also squared by its number of users. So the cost is drastically reduced with each uh, new person added to, to the network. And that's why I think the tipping point of uh, like any type of hyper-Bitcoinization scenario is much lower. The, the threshold is much lower than we think it is because of the immense value, the, the immense power of, of Metcalf's law. And the people don't think in exponentials. Yeah, it's so important to try to be, or to, to not think that it doesn't matter, basically. I don't know it doesn't matter if I, like, no one will notice or no one will care. I think uh, if you can be an example for one other person, that's like fucking amazing. And uh, we saw it during COVID how, at least here in Norway, a big part of the reason why people obeyed so much was because there were, it was very hard for them to see anyone who didn't. Uh, and the moment, you know, <clears throat> someone of any significance dared to stand up and counter the narrative, it was the follow, the ripple effect was huge. And uh, I know in my own circle that a few people almost buckled and for the pressure of getting vaccinated just because they didn't have anyone around them who, who didn't do it. But then when they spoke to someone who could argue for the other side, they were strength, their resolve was strengthened so much and they were able to resist. Yeah. And, and also like when, when the, almost all countries dropped the curfew or, or the mask mandates and stuff 
within like three months, right? Uh, of one another, because uh, and uh, I I traveled a lot during that era, and you see, so in one airport, everyone was wearing a mask, and then the next, no one was wearing a mask. So it's it, it, like made no sense because these are airports, <laughs> like uh, uh, so. Uh, well, it makes no sense anyway. But uh, uh, the the thing I it, it's like when five percent of the of the people in the airport uh, dared to not wear the mask, that's when everyone else just followed suit uh, and and everyone dropped the mask. So the threshold is much lower than you think. Disobedience matters, people. Brush your teeth. Yes. Yes. Or don't. I remember during COVID, I was regularly the only fucking person in the mall without the mask. And it did, it drains you a little bit over time, you know, because you get all these looks and comments and, uh, and friction. But just seeing that one other guy occasionally, you know, meeting his eye on like, yeah. Uh, that was a huge motivating or boost for my resolve just to see that I will, at least I'm not completely alone. That, uh, yeah, I remember meeting you in the airport in Oslo. Do you remember that? (laughs) Yeah. Everyone looking at us for not wearing a mask. (laughs) Yeah. That was in the middle of this bullshit, right? Yeah, it was. And like, yeah. And like with everything else, like Bitcoiners weren't. Like, like we we're also just people, but the the feeling I had from like following the Bitcoin community and the rest of the world is like that we were ahead of the curve. Uh, Bitcoiners were scared of the virus before everyone else was, and was not scared of the virus when everyone else was. Like, like we we <laughs> we like, yeah. As I said, ahead of the curve. That's that's the feeling I got from it. Yeah, like yeah, information asymmetry thing because. I do feel that it's not just because we want to be contrarians. It it is because we base our beliefs not on propaganda or <clears throat> or false like things that are easily proven to be illogical or irrational. But we want to go, you know, to the data points and like make up our own mm-hmm. mind, not just accepting pre-digested uh opinions on things so i think that's what's going on on average bitcoiners are better critical thinkers yeah yeah i think so too first more first principles oriented where the based layer like you have the base layer and you have the based layer uh <laughs> yeah well what was it giacomo who said like if if you do everything completely the opposite of what the government tells you to do you're probably not right about everything, but you're probably better off than if you followed everything they said. Like, <laughs> so. I think that's accurate. I would, I would say you're definitely better off instead of probably. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think he used the word definitely too, and I, I agree to the, to that. No, but that that's so interesting. Like block mentality, and and uh, another thing I found so interesting about the late stage COVID uh, was that the 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 rules changed quicker and quicker. The, the further down this horrible path we went and the, and it became like a virtue signaling me- mechanism for obedient people to follow the new rule every week like <laughs> to adapt to the new fucking thing that they were uh like trying to shove down our throats which is like the the opposite of 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 a bitcoiner an obedience maximalist it was really like opening opening a uh, a hole into the books of the dark side of humanity, what was happening there. And uh, I'm sure it's not the last time in history, you know, the uh, average man is going to be weaponized by false narratives against people who want freedom. Because of that, it's always good to almost like Bitcoin's uh, resistance grows by every attack. I think to, to have freedom, we need. We need attacks, and we need attacks that fail to remind people. Yeah, I was just getting to that. There, there might even be a question in here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> they, that's the thing, I mean, because on, on, on the whole, do you think this attack was a net positive for humanity? Because the things I saw like was, first of all, 
this video conferencing uh, became instantly became bearably good. Like before COVID, it was sort of too clunky to for people to actually use it. This is relatively new being able to do this like like without issues. <laughs> and I think COVID really propelled that, or the lockdowns did. And the, the other thing is, like, uh, of course, a new generation of Bitcoiners were born. The, the, the percentage of freedom lovers in the world is, is probably bigger now than before COVID. I think so. I think it's uh, similar. I think it's very relatable to Bitcoin. And uh, because with Bitcoin, I think it was extremely important that Bitcoin has been attacked the way it has all along its history. I think the, the, the block size war was extremely important. I think uh, the continued, you know, attacks uh, because resistance also needs to scale. And if instead there had been the illusion of zero attacks, you got like a complacent uh, space of Bitcoiners who didn't anticipate attacks that weren't used to attacks. And suddenly you had like, let's say, an extremely well-funded attack with the with a Craig Wright that uh, wasn't a clown. It could have been way worse, and the same, the same with you know the same with COVID. If if certain parameters had been different, or if if COVID did never happened, and if they had an even better and more thought through and you know finally executed version of such a scare, I think they could just lock down the whole humankind into some perpetual dystopia. Uh, but that will be harder now because of COVID. Yeah, and uh, I heard the, the arguments for harder lockdowns. Uh, like this was when when I when I stopped listening to Sam Harris forever. Like when he was so totally pro that. Uh, oh, one of these arguments was like, uh, imagine if if the virus was ten times as deadly, then it would be ten times more important to have the lockdown policies. But I completely disagree. If the virus is ten times more deadly people will take more responsibility for their own actions. Like, that's just inevitable. Like, if it's actually dangerous, people won't go to the office voluntarily. So, like, it, that makes no sense. We can't, we can't, I mean, any thinking person that argues along those lines, to me, is just like, I, I don't even understand it because the end, end road of that, Type of logic is that we can't have freedoms because there will always be threats and you can <laughs> there will always be risks associated with life but once you legitimize forcefully restricting people's freedom over a narrative of risk it's game over because that's that's a slide that you don't it never stops midway it stops at complete prison world and uh yeah, I, I think that that was also a good thing that more people probably have uh, made their observations and reflections on the dynamic between freedom and uh, and safety. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the quote for the intro, by the way. That that last little rant could be fantastic. Well, uh, I think I think maybe we're. Uh drawing to a conclusion on this conversation actually actually i think i think our our um friend uh, and now colleague peter dunworth would be mad if if we i didn't ask you one last time a little bit more about uh, the bitcoin advisor uh, can you tell us a little bit more about why you got involved with with that and uh, what uh goes on there yeah i've always been very cognizant and uh, vocal about the importance of, of self-custody. Uh, and I think not your keys, not your coins is one of the most important memes in Bitcoin. I think it's strange that today people still believe, or many people still believe they own Bitcoin by having them on an exchange or buying an ETF product. In my opinion, they don't own those Bitcoins, obviously, since they don't have the keys. So what the Bitcoin advisor does is uh, help people who may not have the, the technical uh, capacity to securely take self-custody of their coins, to help them transition from an exchange 
uh, into a solid self-custody, which is done through what we call collaborative uh, custody, which is a, a multi-sig solution uh, with no single point of failure, while the client still retains full sovereignty of their funds. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, so so this is what uh, you're doing these days. Um, anything else you'd like to direct our listeners towards? Where can they find you on the internet? I think this one's pretty easy, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm mostly on X under the Hodlonot uh, handle. I guess that's, that's uh, where I do all of my public-facing, opinionating on shit, all my shit posting. We do run our magazine, Citadel 21, still. Uh, we have two volumes left to print, volume 20 and volume 21. So anyone wanting some very non-compromising, legit Bitcoin culture readings, go to citadel21.com and read it for free online. Or you can uh, visit our shop and uh, buy yourself a copy of one or more of the editions. They are all have numbered and limited to a thousand copies each. I think it's a cool brand, and uh, there has been exactly zero percent selling out on that project. It's been, yeah, like a, some type of a hot uh, project for me and Katya. So we haven't made any money on it, but we made a lot of friends and a lot of cool magazines. Yeah, you definitely did. All right. Mr. Cat, thank you very much for this conversation. We enjoyed it immensely, and we hope you did too. And we hope our listeners did too. This was a uh, slightly odd episode, but I loved it. So <laughs> take care. Good luck with everything. Yeah, great. Thank you guys, talk soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks again, Mr. Cat. And, uh, and this has been the Freedom Footprint Show, and Knut has something else to say. I do. Uh, <laughs> if you're trying to follow Hold or Not on, uh, on X, or Twitter, make sure you find the right one because you have more f- fake accounts running around than than uh, Satoshi himself, I guess. Yeah, it's fucked up. I, I have no idea why they can't easily fix that issue. But yeah, follow the right one. H-O-D-L-O-N-A-U-T. All right. Fantastic. Thank you again, Hodlonot. And this has been the Freedom Footprint Show. Thanks for listening. Thank you, guys.